Welcome to Good Game, I'm Bajo. And I'm Hex. This week on the show, we find out if Far Cry Primal is the paleo diet of action games. Yes, is it just a mammoth fad? Actually, it's really good. Mm. Plus, we dive back into Dying Light to fight zombies once more in its first big expansion, The Following. Nick Boy joins us for a first play of Devil Daggers. But before all that, can you name the game for this week? All right, it's time to take on the zombie hordes in Dying Light the following, as once again we step into the shoes of forgettable hero Kenny Crane. Isn't his name Kyle? I've forgotten. It's worth mentioning that this isn't a standalone expansion, so you will need to own the original Dying Light. And you'll also need a character that's made it through at least the prologue of the main game. You'll be bringing that character along too, so any gear or skills you have will carry over. This time out, old mate Kevin Crane gets some information about a mysterious group of people outside the city who are immune to the zombie virus. So he heads off to find them to get his hands on whatever it is they have. Pretty quickly you find out this group worships someone or something known as the mother who holds all the secrets to the cure. No one wants you here. But being a distrustful cult, they're in no mood to share anything with you, so to get them to open up to you, you'll first have to earn their trust. If you do enough good for our community. And to do that, you just have to do side quests. Then, once you've earned enough trust points, lol, you can progress a bit more through the story. You know, usually I don't like it when games lock the main story away like that, but I think they've actually paced it out quite well here. There's always a wide selection of quests available, so you can just pick the ones you want to do. And you don't have to complete many of them to level up your trust, so it didn't really feel like a grind to move on. Now, all of this takes place in a vast new area. It's about twice as big as the original game, but it's much less dense because it's all in open fields. And since there's not much to climb on, you'll be relying on a trusty dune buggy to get around. I was a bit sad there wasn't a lot of climbing, though. You know, the parkour system is so great, it just felt really underused. I don't know, I think it was a good move to try and mix things up. Often with these big expansions, I always feel like I'm just playing more of the same game, but this felt a bit different and fresh. Well, I think they could have found a middle ground. There is one town to climb around, but just a few more towns spread around the place would have been nice. Fair enough, but you can't deny that it's so much fun driving around. No, oh, for sure. It's like if Forza Horizon crossed over with The Walking Dead. And there's a nice, deep skill tree dedicated to the buggy. I especially like that you can equip it with some offensive bits of kit, like a flamethrower or, my favourite, the landmine dispenser. And just like your weapons, your buggy parts will take damage and degrade as you drive over rough roads or gunk up your bumper with some undead roadkill. And you can even run out of fuel. So if you don't drive carefully, you'll be repairing or replacing parts regularly. And Hex, I did not drive carefully. But what did you think of the story? Well, I still don't really like Kanye Crane as the hero. Where? Shot him straight through the head. No, you idiot. Where is his body? Oh, not far from here. And it just doesn't feel like there's a lot going on. Most of the game, you're just doing side quests and running errands. And come back to us with all that stuff. But there's a really strong finale, and I actually think that made up for it. And overall, I do think this story is much stronger than the first game. Yeah, and it's a big game, too. Even though I just focused on getting through the story as fast as possible, it still took about 14 hours. Well, let's wrap this up. What are you giving it? Well, I think the Doom Buggy is great, and it's good to see how well this runs on PC. It's a generous expansion. I'm going to give it four out of five stars. It's three and a half from me. This week, I want to talk about virtual reality. Specifically, the price we're all going to have to pay for it. Yes, just like last year and the year before it, 2016 is promising to be the year of VR, as the long-awaited headsets finally hit store shelves. The dream of leaving this drab world behind for our digital utopia is finally within our grasp. Ah, 
Virtue goes 6,500. <gasps> oh! But just as things were starting to get exciting, we got a serious reality check in the form of a price. And no, I'm not talking about the price you're going to pay after experiencing the wonders of VR for the very first time. Oh, oh God, why didn't anybody tell me? <laughs> no, I'm talking cold, hard cash, over a grand to be more precise, because that's how much the Oculus Rift is going to cost Aussies. $900 reduce! While the Vive is looking to cost even more plus shipping, and of course there's the price of the high-end PC you'll actually need to run these things. Sure, there'll be cheaper options like the Gear VR, or cheaper still, Google Cardboard, if you're okay wearing a tissue box on your face. But you'll still need a pricey smartphone to get said tissue box to work. So is VR, as many are saying, too expensive? Well, yeah, it is. But in my opinion, being expensive is exactly what this kind of tech needs right now. The way I see it, those behind VR are aiming for it to eventually become a ubiquitous piece of tech. But it's still early days. Heck, it's pre-early days. VR is cutting-edge enthusiast technology for now. And it needs to be if it has any chance of one day becoming the standard in home entertainment. That's how these things grow to be accepted, especially something as foreign as VR, which, to be fair, we have spent the last decade portraying in films as innocently fun at first, but eventually you're stuck in the grid or mowing lawns. I don't, I don't know, I didn't actually see that one. I, for one, am happy that those behind this new tech are being responsible by not starting an all-out price war to be the best seller instead of being the best VR experience. Because they know that in the long run, it's that experience that will get their product moving off shelves. The last thing we want are manufacturers cutting costs on something that already has the potential to cause a lot of this. Of course, the real fear is that if it stays this expensive and doesn't sell well, then no one's going to buy it, and no users equals no content, and then the whole thing just falls apart. It's definitely a scary thought, all those years of teasing us with its potential, and now we're all panicking that it might go belly up before we even get a chance to try the damn thing. But let's be rational for a moment. When has any emerging piece of shiny new tech ever been cheaper than we expected? Need I remind you of the PS3's infamous launch price? But as history shows, given time, of course, prices will go down, and this stuff will eventually spread out into the mass market. So maybe 2016 won't be the year of VR for everyone, but it might just be the year that it finally got underway. And one day we'll look back through our inbuilt, augmented, digitally enhanced eyeball screens and reminisce about the time we were excited to look like this. <laughs> But that's just my opinion. Do you think VR is a doomed fad at those prices? Or is it already too big to fail? Let us know on social media and Nick Boy and I will discuss your thoughts tomorrow on Pocket. Right, now it's time for a first play and this week Nick Boy faces the demons of hell. Yes, I'm glad Nick Boy got to play this one. Thanks guys. Now, Devil Daggers is a new PC game by developer Sorath. It's inspired by 90s FPS Twitch shooters like Quake and prides itself on being incredibly challenging. How challenging? I hear you scream at your televisions. Well, there is only one achievement in the game and it is to last 500 seconds. Sure, that doesn't sound like very long, but at the time of recording, only one person has unlocked that achievement. Well, friends, prepare to meet number two. Number two is me. I'm, I'm gonna unlock it. I'm Nick Boy, nice to meet you. Oh, hi. They follow me. Ram's head. Okay. Oh! Okay, maybe can I kill these things that are spawning them? I'm sure I can. Let's try to focus on the thing. Yes, I can. Fountains of blood! Uh... 44? That's not bad. I only need to do another 456 seconds. And I've made not really a world record, but I've unlocked something that I don't care about. You need to get in a rhythm with these things. It's like the first hundred times I play it is just practice. This is just practice. None of this counts. None of this counts. Don't even put it in the show. The way to actually play this is with a good set of headphones, just completely immersed. I mean, that's also a, a way to go insane. Who are you? Who are you? What are you? 48 seconds, a new personal record. 
It's like you shoot a tower and then just as you feel like you're about to get it, you remember that there's probably a hundred things behind you and you turn around just in time. What's good here is the loop. It reminds me of something like Super Meat Boy or Hotline Miami or something where you die and then you can just instantly restart. There's no loading screens or anything. It just goes like, do you want another go? And you click yes and you're straight back into it. So you can feel as though you don't really break your rhythm. Shit. That really frustrated me. Okay. Oh, I didn't even think that there was a ram's head to my left. Which is a sentence I wouldn't normally say. It's really giving me a new appreciation for top-down. How good would some top-down be right now? See, here's the problem. I'm doing too well. And, uh, and I'm angering that thing. <sighs> How does anyone last 500 seconds in this game? I actually think it's impossible and cheaters. I know at the beginning of the uh, segment I did gloat a little bit about the fact that I would definitely get 500 seconds. Prepare yourself for some disappointment. We're gonna readjust that to 60 seconds. I'm gonna see if I can last a minute in this game. I feel like a minute in hell is probably all I need. Oh, come on! 52! 52! That was at least seven minutes! What is that green thing? What is... 55. 55. I'm so close. <laughs> 57. And you personal record. That means a minute. Does it mean a minute? A minute! Oh my god! Oh my god! I've never ever been this happy playing a video game. And I've never been this happy to stop. Don't make me do it anymore. A minute. That's all I have in me. Okay, so that's Devil Daggers. I'm gonna leave this screen up here as a reminder of my achievement. Insanely hard, because Devil Daggers is a game about seconds. If you spend one second shooting something that you miss or that you shouldn't have been shooting and not focusing on something else, you're probably going to die. All that culminates in an incredibly stressful game. Every time you die, I just was feeling it more and more. I was sweating, I was cramping up, I'm so focused on it. When I hit 60 seconds, the relief and the happiness I felt was completely real. I paid $5 for this game. I'd pay five bucks for that emotion again. So that is my first play of Devil Daggers. Will there be a second one? Yeah, I think so, because I really want to recapture that five seconds of pride and joy. All I need to do is suffer for an hour to get it. And it's totally worth it. In a time before wingsuits, automatic rifles and dual-band Wi-Fi, the rules of the land were simple. Gather, eat, breed and hunt. Primal is a savage, gory game, and it's also a risky spin-off from the popular open-world shooter series. Oh, 
Bajo, I had no idea what to expect with this, but I have to say, I feared the worst. It just seemed like a bit of a gimmick, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It looked like they took the worst things from Far Cry and made a whole <laughs> game of it. But this is a fully fledged AAA game, just as big as Far Cry 4 and a ripping good time. Yeah, let's start with the story. It's 10,000 BCE in Central Europe. Rhinos, bears, wolves and mammoths roam a wild landscape of forest and ice. Three main tribes fight for control of the land. The hungry cannibals, Udam. The Izila, who are masters of fire. And your tribe, the Winja, who are only masters of getting lost and captured, it seems. It's a great setup, isn't it? Yeah, I love the interactions at the start and how it pushes you to reunite your tribe. And while we're no strangers to survival games, placing it in this setting suddenly feels so natural. You're living off the land, you're crafting, you're fighting for your life. Because that's the way people lived back then. I'm so surprised there haven't been more games set in this genre, Bajo. It just seems so obvious. Yeah, there probably will be now. I really liked the character design and especially the language that they've come up with. We recently spoke to the game's writer, Kevin Short, who talked about what it's like making a game in a prehistoric past. In terms of how precise we are in, in historically with the game, we did a lot of research. We wanted to make sure that we're as true as possible. It was, it was a huge process. We met with filmmakers who had already uh, done this sort of work. One of the things they highlighted to us was that, look, this is prehistory. So there's certain things we don't know. So don't be afraid to push those, to explore what could be. We've got evidence of stones and uh, bones, but we don't know some of the wood weaponry. That stuff's all disappeared. We don't have a lot of evidence of that. So we were encouraged, you know, just feel free to explore that and see what you can come up with. We start our game and we start hearing English. It's gonna pull you back. You know, the world's gonna be beautiful and, and, and immersive, and then they're gonna start speaking your language. So we made the choice that we're gonna invent a language. So we reached out to linguists. Two of the key people we found were Andrew and Brenna Bird, who are experts in this field. Andrew himself knows all about Proto-Indo-European, a prehistoric language. There's no written record of it, uh, but they, by, by kind of reverse engineering our languages, they're able to figure out what that would have been. So we worked with them and they helped us establish this language that we've put into the game. And there is no uh, English at all in our game. You know what, Hex? I relate more to these ancient ancestors than any of the characters in the other Far Cry games. Yes, oh my gosh, it's like a dream come true, a Far Cry game with no annoying douchebags you have to rescue. Although, don't you think it would have been a perfect opportunity to have a gender choice at the start of this Far Cry? Yeah, you know, I was wondering about that too, and at first I thought maybe, you know, it's because it's a primitive culture and they're thinking that women play a more submissive oh. role. But then you encounter these really awesome okay. female independent characters in the game, so clearly that's, you know, not the law of the land here. Yeah, and it's a fantastical world anyway. There's no reason why they couldn't have done that. There's nothing in the story that I found was really related specifically to a man. No. Or it didn't have to be that way. Missed opportunity for sure. Yeah. Guama. That aside, this game really does feel like it has a soul to it though. Yeah, and I think that's because you can really understand your character and your tribe's motivations. I mean, this is a fight for territory and survival. <laughs> <laughs> As you move through the wild land, you'll gather crafting materials to upgrade your gear and base, hunt and skin animals, and fight off rival tribes for territory. You do get a sense of just how fragile life is in this time. There's no bullet-resistant armour to protect you, and while there are no bullets, one spear in the chest is instant death for your enemies. You do eventually meet some heavily armoured enemies a good 10 hours into the game, but even they feel relatively fragile. Especially when faced with a mighty cave bear. The tribal enemies are really terrifying, and this game is quite violent. Which, you know, makes sense when you're dealing with a ruthless, primitive world of clubs and spears, but it's still confronting seeing the aftermath of your encounters. I mean, I'm all for combat and defending myself, but I could have done with a little bit less bashed-in heads and guts pouring out. 
What about Dying Light earlier in the show? That was full of gore, yeah. more than this even. But that's different. It's zombies. It's a horror genre. It's decaying corpses and stuff. You kind of expect it and, and appreciate it in a way there, but it's this is other humans. I didn't feel like this was over the top, and, and once you kind of notice it the first time, you kind of become desensitised to it and don't pay attention. I think it really suits the time, that kind of violence, yeah. the brutality of it. Fair enough. Uh, I did really like how alive this whole world feels. There are just bugs and animals everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, and there's so much variety and beauty in the way the fauna's arranged. Yeah, at certain times of the day, it's just breathtaking. You know, it kept kind of reminding me of Skyrim, actually. Yeah, I was getting mad Skyrim vibes, and not just from the collecting and crafting, but also the melee combat, which they've done a great job with. This game is half human warfare, half creature combat. Initially, you'll just be clubbing and spearing some pretty harmless beasts. Oh, I chased so many goats, Hex. Come here, you. Come on, goat. Come here, goat. Come on, goat. Come here, stupid goat. <laughs> you know, I got right into living off the land, but I have to admit, I did feel a bit bad killing and skinning all of those animals. But it's survival. Also, that in a video game, I, I didn't feel bad. Well, until I did this. Oh, you're a monster. The difficulty fighting animals progresses really quickly, though, doesn't it? Yeah. Bears will be a tough fight. Packs of wolves will run around you. The rivers and lakes are deceptively calm. quickly learn never to upset a herd of rhinos. Yeah, or mammoths for that matter. One thing I really liked is when the mammoths chase you, along with that little red dot that you're trying to run away from on the mini-map, you feel the rumble of their feet with the controller. It's so stressful. Yeah, and you know, it's nice to have real fear in an open world game. It's not just, you know, hide behind a box and regen some health. You have to run and zigzag to stay alive. It's frantic, but it's a lot of fun. The creature design is really polished too. I find so often in video games, whenever there's animals and creatures, they're always a bit wonky. You know, they're animations and they kind of get stuck on things. But in this, they move really well and they fight each other. And I think that's a real achievement. Along with the story missions, there's vast caves to explore and random encounters pop up all over the map. It's just so easy to get distracted and lost with all the tasks that you find in front of you. Yeah, and navigating this world is a joy, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you move fast and you constantly unlock ways to move even faster. Climbing and leaping over objects works well and it's actually really hard to die from fall damage. I love how you slide down most steep cliffs. It's just, it's forgiving in all the right ways. Yeah, you feel at one with the land. And whatever you do in this game rewards you properly too, with, say, tribes people or skill points. Oh, and the perks hex. I need to unlock all of them. Yeah, you really feel their impact too. Most importantly, though, Beastmaster perks allow you to ride a frickin' bear. <laughs> I was a fan of the saber tooth myself. They're just so fast and deadly. Yeah, taming animals is a big part of this game. You can always have one animal companion by your side, and wandering around with your beast really suits the vibe of the game. And there's just so many to collect. It's like primal Pokemon and rare ones too. Where are they? <laughs> Gotta catch them all, Hex. I was also a fan of the badges. It's good to see them returning. They're still relentless and tough, but now they can be your ally. <laughs> The taming mechanic is a bit simple, but I think it's also a bit dangerous, and it works. Yeah, it can be really tense when you're trying to tame a big, scary creature. I love how each animal has their own stats and perks, too. For example, bears will aggro enemies. 
And some animals are better at stealth takedowns. Having an animal by your side also seems to help ward off predators, which is very important at night. And once you've gathered a full arsenal of woodland creatures, you can really sit back and plan how to efficiently take down the bigger encampments. And these are the most fun. Using your trusty owl companion, you can scout out the battlefield for advantages, tag enemies, and even take out a target completely. Then you might use one of your sneaky animals for a cheeky stealth kill on important targets, like guards that can use a horn to call in reinforcements. Or you can just sit back and send the bear in. They really have got so much right with this game, haven't they? Absolutely. I was so surprised how much fun I had with this. And there's so many nice touches, too. Like how you can see your camp grow. <laughs> Or how when you're out fighting the tribe's people, there are some who are just gatherers who will just run and hide. Or how when you walk over spears and arrows, you automatically pick them up. And this keeps the fights dynamic and exciting. I thought it was really clever how there were patches of grass for you to light in those big labyrinthian caves to help mark your way. Overall, you know, I think this could have been a very silly concept, but they've done such a good job of making it enjoyable to be and live in this world. I think Far Cry Primal will surprise you with just how much fun it can be to live in the past. I'm giving it four out of five. Yeah, it's just so nice to play an open world game that isn't about explosions and guns and gangsters. This is such a refreshing game. I'm giving it four and a half. I think someone's a little jealous of my tribal You do look fabulous. Yeah. I tell you what, I could get used to this, though. Really? It's warm and yet freeing at the same time. A little too freeing, some <laughs> might say. Maybe. Special Agent Bajo, Special Agent Hex, the G-Files. Thanks for coming down so fast, Agents. What's happening here, Sheriff? It's happening all over town. People walking into walls, random ragdoll, some people just falling straight through the earth. It's another occurrence of the glitch, Hex. Well, have you tried cutting power to the entire town and then just turning it back on again? That's the first thing we tried. We even installed the new Sheriff, this guy. Well, maybe you should try naming the game for this week. The first occurrence of the glitch was in 1927, Roswell, New Mexico. It was an undercover operation by the government and the smoking men, and then all the bees came and alien-human hybrids enveloped everyone with weird things going to their ears under the ice. It was Crime Cities for PC, released back at the turn of the millennium. Heavily influenced by the films Blade Runner and The Fifth Element, the game had you piloting a weaponized hovercar, blasting at baddies in other hovercars, and solving crime. More games with hovercars, please. And it was our name the game for this week because it was the very first game developed by Techland, the same developers behind this week's Dying Light the following. Next week on the show, we take on the time-bending first-person shooter, Superhot. Plus, we turn the lights low and peel back the layers of fear. What do we do when we fail? We start over. Yes. That's it. Perfection. What the? Nick Boy will be back to take us on another first play. And don't forget, you can catch him on Pocket every weekday on iView and YouTube. Over on Spawn Point this weekend, it's Plants vs. Zombies in Garden Warfare 2. <laughs> Until next week, Banjo out. Hex out. We should grow a loincloth all the time. Do you though? I do. I mean, if you were just wearing the loincloth, it would be a bit breezy. Room to move? <laughs> Doesn't actually provide a lot of coverage. You couldn't do it on a bicycle. No. Yeah. You ride a lot of bicycles. I do. So I feel like. I tried it once with boxes. That would be particular. Did not go well. Yeah.